Yeah, we're live. I'm late, but I am back. I'm here. I uh, had to take care of tonight, but I'm here and it's time to get going. Tonight we're talking about a couple things. One is the um, the ever popular, you know, Brian Tooley truck Norris cam versus the Matt sloppy best cam. That video is doing well. Well, some people seem to be very popular about it. Although the interesting thing, and I thought that when we did, when I included the comparison of the um, testing both of those cams, along with a bunch of other cams, so essentially bonus tests for people, um, and we ran it on a 5.3 and on a 5.7, I thought that everybody would be happy about that. I knew when I ran it on the 5.7, it was such a weird combination that it was a 5.3 uh, block bored out, which is... Honestly, that should be fairly common. It's, it's much easier to do that than it is to go find an aluminum LS1 anywhere. They're they're very very difficult to find the the, the OG original ones. Um, so, but but it had a weird cylinder head on it and stuff. And so I knew people would not would would not be okay with that. So including the 5.3 deal, which is probably the the most common thing that people would be putting those in. I know people will be putting them in four eights and stuff, but then when you include, even when you include that stuff, I the, the comments that I get are like, oh, well, why didn't you try? You need to run it on a six zero, and you need to run it on a six two, and no, I don't need to run all that. You have all the information that you need to decide whether or not you want one of those two cams because that's e it's easy to decide. I've shown you that they were different cams that they make power at different kind of RPM ranges, so you choose them for different things. Um, and, and as I said, if you want one of those cams and you want boost again, you're choosing the same thing. You're not choosing which, which cam works best under boost. They both work good under boost. All you have to do is still same thing. Pick your NA power output, which one you want, where do you want the thing to make power? If you want the turbo to be more responsive, you pick the smaller cam. If you want more top end charge, pick the bigger cam. But the reality is with a turbo, either one of those cams in a 5.3-ish kind of motor, uh, if you have a 78.75 or an S475 or, or, or GT45, even something smaller, you can top the turbo out with either one of those camshafts. So the, the choice isn't which one works best with a turbo. You're not gonna get any more power from one of those than the other one with a turbo. The turbo is ultimately gonna dictate that. The question again, as always, even if whether you're running NA or turbo charges, what do you want your NA power curve to look like? Do you want more down low? You pick the smaller cam, you want more up top, pick the bigger cam, and then away you go, even with boost, even with nitrous, even with a blower. All of that stuff works out all based on what the thing is doing NA. Do you want to change your, you know, if you're running a 4.8 or 5.3, do you want to change your um, stall speed converter, which is necessary, especially with the best cam, I'm sure. Less so with the truck Norris cam. So again, all, all of those are things that you ask irrespective of what you would be doing with the turbo or how much power you could make or which one of them even is the best cam. Although the best cam already has the best cam right in the name. So, <laughs> which is why it has that name. Um, but uh, tonight the video or the, at least the thumbnail that I put up was about boost controllers. And for years and years and years, I mean, this goes way back, way, way back into the probably late eighties or, or certainly the early nineties. Um, running manual boost controllers, which is basically a bleed valve. Back in the day, we didn't even have the fancy one that I showed you, the super ability one. Um, the one that I use is a Turbo uh, Turbo XS, I think. Yeah, it's it that that single. It's a little blue one with the little Allen headed screw deep down in the top of the recess. That one has, I'm sure, has been on more turbo combinations than any other boost controller in the history of the world. <laughs> I've run it on literally everything that we've run it on and it always works well but the 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 concept of it is very simple it's just, it's just a simple bleed valve that is intercepting the signal from the the boost signal from the manifold or wherever you plummet some guys plummet from the turbo i like to plummet from the manifold because the, the ultimately the boost pressure is going to be higher if you do it that way but it intercepts a signal and bleeds some of it off so the wastegate thinks oh i'm only seeing like eight pounds and the, the motor's like eh, it's actually 10 pounds but we're bleeding some of it off but you don't know that because we have a we have a bleed controller um the interesting thing is the the bleed the one that i showed you works differently than the other one um that they're they're doing a similar thing they're bleeding some of the signal but they're doing it in different ways so it's it's interesting but the question is, and, and for this video or for this discussion, this live feed discussion tonight is, do people still use those? I know that I do. do you, are you guys out there using them still? Or does everybody now just go to an electronic controller? Now, an electronic controller, for those of you 
who don't understand exactly how these works for you guys are watching the video the the turbo the boost the, the boost supplied by the turbo is controlled by the wastegate the wastegate basically opens up and, and and allows basically a giant exhaust leak that limits the exhaust energy to the turbo and that's regulated by the boost pressure in the motor so the the turbo is blowing boost into the motor we get a signal from that to the wastegate and at a certain boost level the wastegate opens up depending on the spring or our controller uh, and it opens up and bleeds some of that off and so it restricts and, and, and maintains some sort of given boost level with a manual controller you're kind of at the limit of a number of things you're at the limit of what turbo you're using what the back pressure is um, what spring rate you're starting with and so the, the manual controller can only do so much it can only it can only take the signal from the boost signal from the motor supplied by the boost from the turbo, it can only take that signal and alter it. That's all that it can do. It can't, it can't adjust. The nice thing about electronic controller is it can adjust the amount that it's bleeding. So if you want to say, okay, I want 10 pounds, the electronic controller can be pulse width modulated and it can adjust how much it's like opening and closing the wastegate to try to maintain that. And, and there, a lot of them are very good at that. And so you, what, what you end up having is a nice flat boost curve. If you have something strange going on with like excessive back pressure or not a lot of back pressure or whatever the whatever your turbo system is doing on your particular NA combination, the manual controller really is just going to say, okay, I whatever boost pressure you're wanting, um, if you want more, we're gonna bleed some more of that signal off. And so this thing will stay closed. But the problem is it's not really staying closed. It's gonna open up a little bit the back pressure is going to open it up a little bit. You usually have because the because the electronic boost control, and you can do this with a manual controller too. You can, if you configure it properly, the best way to do it to have um, the greatest boost response and not have it start opening opening up prematurely is to um, run it both to the top and bottom um, signals on the wastegate both to the top side of the diaphragm and to the bottom side of the diaphragm. The bottom side of the diaphragm opens up the valve and that's what bleeds the, the exhaust pressure off. The top side holds it closed. That's where the spring is. So you're pushing against the spring to open the valve, but you don't want it to open up ideally on a turbo application. You don't want it to open up at all until you've reached whatever boost level you want that to be. So if you set it at 10 pounds, you want that thing staying exactly closed until 10 pounds and then you want it opening up and with an electronic controller you want it cycling so that it stays right at 10 pounds the manual controller won't do that but if you plumb it correctly you can get a little bit better uh initial response because you can hold it closed longer and then it will just open up at whatever whatever you have your regulator set to but the thing is with a manual controller all you're going to do is go okay all you can do basically is go okay i want more boost now okay well let's we'll do a turn out or a turn in depending on which direction increases the boost depending on which design it is we're going to go a turn out or a turn in and that's going to basically bleed some more of the signal and then it's going to trick it and raise the boost but the curve that it produces is is solely going to be a function of what's going on with the na motor and the turbo that you're using and the response from that size turbo on that na motor and then how the exhaust back pressure is and, and other things with the electronic controller you have much more control and you can say, look, I want it to be 10 pounds and you can set it. A lot of them have map sensors that help regulate the pressure. And so you can say, look, I want it at 10 pounds and it will go, okay, well, I'm not open until we see 10 pounds. And then I'm not going to let it go any more than 10 pounds. And then you see maybe just a little bit of fluctuation there while the thing is doing what it's supposed to be doing. And that works out really well for the electronic controller stuff. A lot of the ECUs have the ability to control those, like the Holly that we use. Normally, I run, because it's already set up on the dyno, we run that TC1, but it's just controlling, you know, it's it's a pulse with modulated signal, basically. And you can control that with the Holly or, you know, I'm sure a Fast or these other, the MS3 Pro that we use. All of those, I think, I think I've never tried it on the Fast. We have done it with the Holly, but I know that the MS3 Pro will do it. So you can control those with those ECUs. We just don't, I just don't incorporate that. We have a separate one that we just, we just go up and I set the dial at seven pounds or 10 pounds or whatever the number that we want. And then, then it will just do that. And I do it for single turbos and twin turbos. I just tee the fittings for the twin turbos. And it, it's a lot of, um, with twin turbos and electronic controller. And, and because you're going to both the top and the bottom side of the wastegate on both of them and teeing off of the controller, 
it's a lot of hoses. <laughs> when you first put the motor on, and even after you put the turbo stuff on, you're like, ah, that's a, you know, that's that that's fairly clean. And then when you start putting all the hoses to it, that that's when it like, oh yeah, this is this is really getting out of control. Uh, that's where people walk into the dyno and go, that's not that won't fit in anything. What could you run that on? I well, I can run it on the dyno and it works pretty good. But the electronic controller has a good um, offers a good boost control. And, and, and most of them, you have the ability to adjust the duty cycle. So you're you're affecting the you're altering the effective operating range of the controller because you have to adjust that for what you're wanting it to do. So but that's not that's not, for me, that's more of a trial and error. And then after you've done it for a long time, you kind of know, oh, well, it needs to be at 68 percent right here. And that works out pretty well. So that's good stuff. Um what I want—I wanted to find out from you guys back in the day. Now, are you guys? Are any of you guys still using? Because back in the day, I remember doing stuff with uh, Dave Hanrahan from Tiny Avenger when he was running his SVO Mustang. We did a bunch of testing on the chassis dyno with that, and we were just using the little aquarium valves. And that—it's the same principle, basically. All it's doing is, it's—it's it's closing a flow orifice, and then you're backing it out or you're either closing it or opening it and it's changing the signal basically to the wastegate it does the same thing the problem with those is that it's um they're not very linear <laughs> in how much they it, it's like okay that's a little bit that's a little bit okay that's all of it so you have to be careful with that and sometimes we we put them in line and stack them and we've done lots of different ways we've done um vacuum tees with um uh, you know, Holly jet bleeds on them and, and stack the T's in line on our reference line going from the boost reference in the, in the motor to the wastegate. So there's lots of different ways that you can do it. Um, some guys put little cut little slots in the hose. you know, there's anything that you can do to change the, um, the boost pressure that the wastegate is seeing anything that you can do to alter that signal, you'll, you'll get a change of boost. And that's kind of the great thing is that that's the cool thing with turbos. Uh, we we have, you know, sometimes when we've been testing, I didn't have that controller readily available like I normally do. But uh, so we have to come up with creative ways. So so sometimes it's just, you know, it's it's late at night or whatever. And you're just, OK, well, what 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 different way should we try now? It's a you're going to obviously take the wastegate line off and just rely on the back pressure to open the gate. I don't recommend that um, unless you have something that has high back pressure because you don't know how much it's going to open it up. Um, you can put the the reference line to the top of the wastegate. I also don't recommend that. That's going to be basically all of it. <laughs> so it's going to be all of the boost pushing down to hold the valve closed plus the spring pressure. So unless you have, unless you had a situation where you had much more back pressure um, resisting the amount of spring pressure that you have, and you'd still have to have the boost pressure going to the bottom of bottom of it too, to ever get it to open up at all. Otherwise it's just not going to do that unless you had more back pressure, then you have boost pressure and spring pressure. And I, that's possible, I'm sure, but I I've never seen that actually somebody try to control it that way, <laughs> you know, in theory that could work, I guess. Um, but there are, there are lots of different ways to do it and you can have, um, uh, situations other other things arrive with the boost control you can have um boost creep a lot of times um if you don't have a big enough wastegate uh you just can you continue to have a rising boost curve because basically it, it can't it basically can't allow enough of a an exhaust leak to control the boost because there's just too much exhaust flow and it's like i can't get enough out to really make a sizable difference here and so that can become a problem, but that's not so much control as it is just the, the wastegate sizing. And on the engine dyno, it seems to be when we run turbo stuff that we have an issue with boost control more on the engine dyno. And I'm, I'm assuming it's because of the stationary load and the fact that we're controlling the rate of acceleration. But we've run situations or, or similar setups on the chassis dyno and out on the street and used one wastegate and it's all worked just fine e even at the various different power levels that we've run because we do the same thing we run it you know you run it at seven pounds or ten pounds and then go up to 10 and 15 and 20 and whatever you what, whatever we did on the engine dyno you do on the chassis dyno out and out on the street and the having a single wastegate seems to control it just fine but when we try to do that on the engine dyno sometimes we have um, boost control problems which is why i normally run two wastegates 
on most of my setups. So like you'll notice when on the LS stuff, when I run turbos on the LS, the Y pipe that I had, there's two wastegates on it. And then we just, we just run lines to both of the wastegates and that then we have no, then we have no problem. But the cool thing is that when we have two wastegates like that, we have a single turbo, we can, um, I can unhook one of the wastegates and then, um, only rely on one and then the other one will actually open up based on back pressure or you can run a line to the top of one of them and only rely on so there's some cool like trickery that you can do and and cool testing that you can do when you have two of them and you can play with it. and it definitely it has a decided effect on the booster it's kind of cool but you want to make sure that you have enough control especially as you turn the boost up you don't want it to just go rampant i can remember one time running a we had a 383 stroker ls with a single turbo and i think that it was the precision it was either the precision 76 75 or it was the comp turbo the 80 millimeter comp turbo. we were running a single on it and we had a problem with boost control and i didn't have my controller so what i did and one of the things that we were testing is that we had um a bunch of uh, o2 sensor fittings in the y pipe that we were running and so we would just take one out and then run it again and take another one out and then run it again. And so we would make the turbo much less responsive because essentially those holes, when you, when you start multiplying them, they get to be the size of a wastegate. So it, unfortunately for us, it's already open. So it makes the turbo laggy, but it also allows us to control the situation and make a run so that we can get some sort of power numbers with that turbo on that combination. Um, Whereas we weren't able to do that with just the single wastegate that we have on there. And so you got to sometimes be creative and, and create other kinds of leaks and, and having a whole bunch of them on there. And especially the size of an O2 sensor um, allows you to take that out. And, you know, it, it, it worked OK. It wasn't it wasn't ideal for what we were trying to do, but it did allow us to make runs. And, and, and what we got is a you know, we were able to get kind of a rising boost curve. And I think we were making, I don't know it wasn't a lot. It was less than 20 pounds, but it was a lot of power, even at that boost level. Um, I think it was, if I remember right, it was over a thousand horsepower um, at, at those kinds of boost levels, even just that. Once that. We were just trying to get the big number in that case. So let's see what you guys are doing tonight. I'm sure a lot of people are probably watching. I think that there are playoff games going on tonight. So I'm sure guys are out there watching that. Richard, I'd love to see you test a ProCharger-based B-Series supercharger from Go Auto Works. Are you familiar with it? I'm not familiar with a ProCharger-based B-Series Honda. I've run a lot of Vortec uh, B-Series-based Hondas. We even did our own. If you take a look back at some of the other videos, I think that the, the thumbnail for the video is, is the, the custom supercharger setup that we did that we ran at Bonneville. So we made a cog drive. We mounted the supercharger down near where the air conditioning bracket goes and stuff. And as a matter of fact, we used the air condition, conditioning bracket to make the blower bracket. And my buddy Bernie Van Hammond did it and it worked, worked very well. But the, the problem with centrifugal superchargers, and, and I have the video up where we compare the centrifugal, the Vortec versus the turbo versus the Jackson Racing supercharger, there's just not really a comparison in terms of like boost response for that compared to a turbo. I use a ch cheap fuel pressure regulator as a bypass valve on my Chrysler. It sends no pressure to the wastegate till you reach the set boost pressure. That makes sense. That's good. I do have a good question. Can, can enough exhaust back pressure actually blow the manifolds apart? Can, can it blow the exhaust manifolds apart? I, I mean, that, that's going to be a, a mild steel or stainless steel or cast exhaust manifold and i don't know what the bursting point is but it's way higher than you could get from a turbo setup i'm sure unless the thing already had a crack or something in it it would be really cool to compare the 3800 and the honda j series i i don't think I don't think that the um, 3800 is in the same power league as the J series is. I think that they have J series stuff 
that's 300 horsepower or more NA, certainly in the 3.7 stuff. And the 3800 is an NA one is more like 200. So it's a big difference in NA power. <laughs> Terry's watching Rick, Rick and Morty. Richard, any experience with the Procharger with variable geometry? I, I, when I went to PRI one year, I sat in with the guys and asked them about it and asked them if we could do a test on it, but it just never came to be. It's a fairly small unit. Um, and there's there, I didn't think it was variable geometry. I thought it was variable speed. Have you tested a rising rate electronic boost controller that can be set by RPM? For example, make a boost curve on a turbo similar to a centrifugal. We have that ability with the TC1. We it, it will accept an RPM reference. And so I'm actually going to do that when we run the when we run the 3800. In fact, probably whatever the next turbo thing that I run on the dyno, I want to I want to test it because I haven't run it yet based on RPM, but Eric from Westex set it up so that we could do that now. So I want to supply it an RPM signal and then make a curve like that because that's that's going to be the best thing for a, and especially for the, I, I did it really wanted him to do it for the big block, big bang, because we don't need all of the boost in the middle part. Because right now, the last time we tested it, it makes the same torque as horsepower, and that's not what we want for a big bang motor. Uh, NA408 LS, 823 heads, 469 cam, 12 to 1 compression on 93 octane. I don't know why you would do that. I don't know why you'd have that much static compression and, and just want to run 93. Um, I don't know how much timing. The, the top timing is not where you're going to get detonation. You're going to get detonation at the torque peak or lower. Uh, at the When the thing is running RPM, detonation becomes much less of a problem. I don't know how good the 12 to 1 piston is. Like, I don't know how much dome you have there. So I don't know what flame travel is like. But we typically run uh, 29 degrees on the top. Our motors are fairly cold. So it's going to be less than that. I see import race cars at imports versus domestics uh, World Cup with external wastegates directly on the turbo exhaust housing. Seems said it acts like a variable AR. So I, I've seen Matt from Sloppy has mounted them directly on the turbo housing. Um, I haven't done any testing on it. Jack, I was working on a Lego model prototype diesel. Nice. <laughs> I used a keychain F1A94. I'm wondering because it's based on two 4BT Cummings, how much boost is needed to replace the turbo that was thrown away? Is this a Lego motor? <laughs> maybe, maybe I missed something. Are you going to Power Tour? I've never gone to that ever, I don't think. I'm bringing my Mark III Super this year. I would like to think... Oh, thank you for helping work out the M122 1UZ combo. That's kind of cool that you did that with a roots blower and a V8 in that. I like the Megasquirt boost control. You can set boost by RPM, speed, gear, or even custom sensor like a suspension travel, real travel. All of that is really good for actually being in the car and setting it up so that you optimize acceleration in the thing that you're doing. All, all that's really good, um, especially the, the RPM is good. But vehicle speed and gear dependent boost is also very important because it's really easy to have too much boost, like in first gear or second gear, sometimes third gear, depending on how much power they're making. Richard, can we set a time up with a car to have you dial it in? We need an electronic boost controller on a custom car. It's too radical now. We need to set variable power levels. You... you I don't know. I don't do that. I don't do tuning, but the guys at West Tech can certainly do that if you're local to Southern California. A desert off road twin turbo LS9 stroke to 440. Uh, Jack, I don't know how much 
boost? I mean, can't you just figure out how much boost the other two turbos were doing? I think the variable AR setups push all exhaust through one side of a twin scroll turbo, then both sides. That's a um, oh, that's like a quick spool valve does that. But I don't think that having the wastegate there is going to affect that unless you have it plumbed back to the exhaust. All the boosts the Honda needs is a leaf blower. But you haven't seen what turbo Hondas can do. Do you have an opinion on closed loop versus open loop boost control? Well, it has to be um, it has to be closed loop, right? Otherwise, it's not going to control boost. It has to get a signal from something, right? It's definitely getting a it's definitely getting a boost signal. Does that mean it's running in closed loop? Yeah, the spool valves are kind of cool, especially for a really big turbo. And I would think for a rotary, a big turbo rotary, that a spool valve, a quick spool valve would kind of be beneficial. So, Jack, there are guys helping you out with what they think that the boost level was on that comment. I'm not familiar with that diesel motor. I don't do a lot of diesel work, but so I don't know what the boost was. The one thing that's going to happen on that motor is, is with a centrifugal blower, the, the boost curves can be dramatically different than the turbo was. I don't think a diesel would be very happy with a centrifugal blower. And maybe I didn't understand what it is you were trying to do. I thought you were building a model of an engine. And then so now I don't know why boost entered in the equation. I'm going back to look at some of the questions here. Richard, at what RPM do you recommend spraying a hundred shot? Um, we normally, some guys hit it really low. Um, when we're on the dyno, we hit it at like 4,000 or 4,500. Dean, I really like the 351 F250 turbo truck method of boost control, <laughs> thousand horsepower. I would, you know what I'd like to see is I, I was thinking about it today because um, it was recently Lucky's birthday. And so I wished him happy birthday, but I would like to see those guys run this 3,800, this turbo 3,800 at some power level, six or 700 horsepower, something like that in a car and, and see the thing go down the track. I'd like to see how much, I'd like to see what that thing would do. And I don't know, some kind of cool car, some kind of cool drag racy car. Oh, here we go. I'm, I'm experimenting with spool valves on the rotary at work, but a small shot of nitrous gave us better results. That 
Uh, Tom, thank you. Everybody hit the like button. Um, that's definitely true. And I get that question a lot. As a matter of fact, somebody asked me a question today about running a running nitrous on a centrifugal supercharger. And yeah, nitrous helps everything. And I have, and I didn't think about it, but now that I remember, I we ran nitrous on a centri centrifugal blower. I think it was on a modular Ford with a Paxton Novi supercharger on it. And we wanted to run it as the intercooler, which obviously it didn't do very well as an intercooler because there's not enough of it. And we've gone over that a whole bunch of times, but it does add a lot of power. <laughs> so it, it definitely did that. Sorry, I was looking up an idea about using a CVT supercharger. I, I've had guys ask me, as a matter of fact, I had a guy send me a bunch of information about um, he wanted, to, he was looking at a way to, thinks he has come up with a way to have a variable RPM centrifugal supercharger. And while that works, and we've seen CVT or nose cone, things that change the drive ratio and all, all of that stuff is possible. The problem is it's still a supercharger and it's not going to do what a turbo does. I know I understand wanting to make the thing better, because especially when you see the boost curve. OK, that's a look. It starts way low and then goes up and it's it's at the peak at the top of the RPM range. OK, well, we want more. OK, well, we spin the blower up really fast and then put a blow off valve on it. So we get it to come up sooner and then level off at the top. You can do that. You can do it with, um, you know, the CBT kind of drives and that stuff. But the thing is, is it's still not going to do what a turbo does. You can make it better, and we, and we do that with a lot of different things. You can make the roots blower better by freeing up the inlet and intercooling it and, and pouring the discharge side and all that. You can make them better. The thing is, you just can't make them be something else. And this, if the something else is makes more power, it's going to make more power. It's hard, it's hard to get one thing to equal the other thing. You need 50 pounds of boost to replace the two turbos that were from the original engines that created it. A Chevette would be awesome. The 3800 in a Chevette would be just like perfect, right? An Opal GT, yes. Uh, S10, that's probably been done a lot. A 924 Porsche, I like that. I, yeah, there's lots of people. Uh, Richard, you got people that like the supercharger wine or people that like the sound of the blow off valves. Some people just like that. I mean, all they want is a, they want the noise from the blow off valve of the turbos. Uh, or the, the wine from the supercharger. I understand the guys put Pete Jackson gear drives on their small box so they can make it sound like it has a blower on it. And I understand that. Um, I'm just saying that when you're looking at the boost curves and the power curves, that things are different. Uh, are Kenny Bell blowers the most efficient blower for a street car? A twin screw supercharger is supposed to be the most efficient. Uh, according to the Society of Automotive Engineers, the twin screw design is supposed to be better his four six rotor pack is supposed to be better and i don't know what measure of efficiency people are talking about is it 80 back efficiency is it the one that makes the most power is it the one that's the most responsive there are a lot of different things when people talk about that hi richard if i use stock exhaust manifolds on a turbo ls what size hot and cold size piping is ideal chasing to a 800 to a thousand horsepower it doesn't matter Look at the videos that I have up where we change the diameter and length of the two. We went to three and a half or four inch tubing on the discharge side. It doesn't matter. Just put in what works. We run on the Y pipe that I have. We run stock exhaust manifolds. And then I think I think that the Y pipe is two and a half inches. 
and it works. You can easily make more than a thousand horsepower with it. 3800 and a Chevy Spark. A Chevy Spark is a little too new. Um, I do like the 3800 ID in a Fiero, 680 wheel horsepower, medium boost. It's a handful. I bet I, that 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 is really cool. I I really like the Fiero idea. Well, hello. What? What? Well, go. Go. Oh, you can go. Richard, have you seen the engine that, that is built in turbochargers in the head, one on each exhaust port, tiny impeller deals, I think it was in the 50s. I, I have not seen that. The LS Cadillac blower test was never finished, all in caps, because I'm sure that there's yelling going on. <laughs> Thinking about building a lower a lower end torque monster for a snowplow truck. Not sure which way to go. You ever worked on a Corvair engine? I have not. I don't think think I've ever actually turned a wrench on one of those. The original turbo on it is a Ray J, I think. It's probably fairly small. But if, if you want just stock power, then that will work out good. 3800 F-body, yeah. A, a 600 horsepower V6 Camaro would be fast. <laughs> To set various boost levels by gear, what system and controller do you recommend? I don't know because I've never done that. I've on the engine dyno, obviously we don't do that, and I don't do any kind of tuning like that. Stuff the 3800 in a Miata in the back of a 986. <laughs> They're cheap. Hey Richard, do my first turbo build on a 350. Small block Chevy stock internals has 30 over pistons. What turbo would you recommend for making six, 700 horsepower? Everyone's going to tell you use a GT45. How do you feel about testing different rod bolts? Uh, put a different type in each rod and see which one spins a bearing first. The rod bolt is not going to spin a bearing. The... The problem with changing rod bolts and not resizing the rod after you do that is there's going to be a different amount of crush for each one of the rods. The A rod bolt test is a waste of time on a stock bottom end LS because the rod is going to break. You don't really need rod bolts. Thirty-eight hundred and a Scion. I did have a, a Scion XB. So I want to make a Sky Active LS, high compression and retard cam timing to lower dynamic compression. Uh, so you use the word thoughts at the end of that. So I'm not answering those questions anymore. I, I put my foot down. Do more turbos increase responsiveness because of less mass to spin? No, twins, smaller twins aren't any more responsive than a single big turbo because you have half of the exhaust flowing to them. So if they're both sized appropriately for what you're trying to do, you can get the same kind of response. If you put smaller turbos of either kind, of either single or twins, you can uh, make them more responsive. A 1990 Beretta, yeah. Uh, Corn was the 3800 aluminum head flow test. Inform I emailed you worth anything. It was. It, those things flowed a lot more than I thought. Is it easier to hit horsepower limit to limit horsepower output with timing than trying to use boost gear to gear? I can pull two to three degrees and pull back two or three tenths. That does changing the timing two or three, two to four degrees really knock out two or three tenths of, of ET? Um, I don't know how much, I don't have a feel for how much you have to bring back the power to get the traction that you need. I, I've never done any of that. I don't do any of that kind of tuning. Porsche motors are so much money. That's definitely true. What makes one with the blown motor? The 924 motors are Volkswagen motors, so they're not they're not um, 
really expensive, but they don't make any power. Uh, but they're really good chassis, though. Chrysler 2.2 Turbo update. As soon as we get it on the dyno, I'll be able to update you. Thirty-eight hundred and a seventy-four Datsun pickup. Sorry, those are kind of cool. Uh, ring gap is always recommended with boost. I'm sure guys have run the 3800 in S10s, right? I mean, it, it, that seems like kind of a natural fit for the V6 that was in there. Ford Courier with an RX-713B, nice. Any upcoming tests you have? Yeah, I'm going to run the, um, as a matter of fact, tomorrow I had to go, I, I went out and found, I'll back, back up a little bit. I went out and found a engine stand today. So I found one at a Napa auto parts store. Not that I make Napa auto parts store kind of money, but I had to have one. So I have the 5.9 Magnum in the garage, so I can now take it off of the cherry picker. It's sitting on the ground, but um, I can put it on the engine stand now and disassemble it. So I'm going to disassemble it and try to, clean it and put everything back together the way that it originally was and get that thing ready for testing. I'm going to run the, um, I'm hoping to get the 4200, the Atlas motor back together. And I have the, the um, slant six is down there that I want to get back together. There's lots of cool motors. Um, I have the RB25, which I'm really looking forward to. If I can run the 2.2 Chrysler is, is really high up on the list. So that's probably going to be the next thing that has a big long series associated with it. Because I have a 2.2 and a 2.5 they want to run, although the 2.2 will be done long before the 2.5 will be done. Um, I also want to see if there's a way that I can run my little one liter Chevy Sprint three cylinder. This is going from a 1.6 rocker on a flat tappet to a 1.85. Sound like too much? I, why are you wanting to go with that much more lift? Um, she's not a Labrador. She's a, a Golden Retriever. Huh. Oh, my. There's two of them. Come here. What are you doing? Can you say hi? Can you say hi? Look. Look. Hello. Huh. What are you doing, huh? Who's a good girl? Who's a, I know you have your jealous, too. I know. I know. I'm online. I'm online. I know. You're adorable. I know you are. You guys are good doggies. Okay. Go lay down. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Oh, a 3,800 in the Vega. Yeah, it, it's probably fairly hard to find Vegas, I would imagine. Have you made or will you be making a video on electronic boost controllers, how they work, and how to install them? Yes, I will. I, I think I should do that. My, uh, I, you need to go lay down. I have to move this just a little bit. I know, I know. I, I do want to do that because I also want to do a wastegate video. I want to show what the inside of a wastegate is, what it looks like, how the valve works, all of that stuff. That's really good information for the average guy, guys that don't know what that is, because you have to start at the very beginning, which is a mistake I think a lot of YouTube guys make when they're talking about things is that they're not starting out at the very beginning. Like I want, I want, if I want to learn something new and I go online and I'm looking up something new and start watching videos, they all start from an assumed level of knowledge. And you can't, because I don't, if you're just starting out, you don't know any of that. You don't know the vocabulary. You don't know anything. So if you start out at the very beginning and then bring people up to, this is what a turbo is. This is what this side is. This is what this side is. This is what does this. This is why it does this. Oh, okay, now I have that. Okay, what about the wastegate? Okay, this is what the wastegate does. This is how it moves. This is how it operates. This is what it's working against. This is what the spring does. This is what the diaphragm does. All of that stuff. Then we could talk about wastegate controllers. Okay, why do we need different kinds of controllers? Why can't it just work the way that it's supposed to? And all of that. So it'll, it, it should be good stuff. Chevy Monza with a 3800, a 3800 Regal T-Type. I, I like the 3800, the, the T-Type versions of the Grand Nationals. Uh, 
a stroker engine can handle more valve overlap? Be because of the displacement or because of the piston to valve clearance? More lift for a stroker crank, um, or would a 302 camshaft have the same characteristics for a 351? I don't really understand the question. Um, the, the camshaft is gonna be relatively milder on the larger displacement motor, if that's your question. A 302 camshaft will work on a 351. It will physically fit. It will also make power, but it will be relatively milder on the bigger 351 than on the 302. So for instance, if we put a 274 cam and a 302 with a Victor Junior and Airflow Research Heads, and let's say we made 400 horsepower at 6,200 RPM, if you put that same stuff on a 351, you're going to make more power um, because even if you don't make the same specific output, which you probably will not, you might actually on that combination because it has enough cylinder head. But even if you didn't, um, it's going to make peak power at a lower engine speed on the 351. <laughs> you should do your shows in a lab coat. I actually looked for one for a long time, uh, only because I wanted to do um, the professor approach on some of the things that I was talking about, because it would have been cool. Thirty-eight hundred turbo celebrity wagon. Wow, that's that's definitely other guys' stuff. Yes, the, the, with the same combination of stuff, the 351 will make more power than the 302. Divided by 302. So that's 1.32 horsepower per cubic inch on a 302 times 351, 465 horsepower. Um, if they made the same specific output, which they wouldn't, but you can see how much leeway that they have there based on their displacement. Even if it, even if the the specific output on the 351 came down a lot, which it would a little bit, like I said, because the camshaft is less wild on the 351 than it is on the 302. Even if that's the case, even if we're limiting the 351 because because it has a 302 camshaft in it, it still has like 65 horsepower to play with. So let's say that it made 430. It's still going to make more, even even though the specific output is not going to be is going to be less. I always wanted to put a 351 in my Fox car. I still have my Fox, but I would like to have, a, um, I want one of the old um, Pace Car or Caro editions or the um, King Cobra <laughs> Mustangs to put a real kind of 302 in. That would be awesome. Because everybody knows that those were, those were really, really slow. It, you could also put a, an aluminum 4.8 or an aluminum 5.3 in it. You want a Max Stroker 302 and want an ISKI cam in the engine. Okay. We want what we want. <laughs> the, the biggest 302 I've seen is the guys from uh, MPG did a, a 410 inch stroker short deck motor, which was very, very cool. Uh, that's one big misconception. I don't know what this is in response to. I don't know who said something about that. That's one big misconception people have about turbos that exhaust air is spinning the turbine. Well, partly true. Most of it is actually thermal energy doing the work. 
you guys can feel free to make comments about that. Mustang 2, Boredom 0. Somebody remembers. There is a 3800 stroker rotating assembly, but I have like zero interest in um, doing a stroker version of that motor. It just, it's so much easier to just do more boost. Oh, look, I want to build a 4.3 meter version of the 3800. Oh, here, that's two pounds of boost. And voila, I've done it. Ooh, a Trabant, that would be good. That that should definitely be other guys, right? One liter Geo Metro turbo conversion. I don't even know what motor the Trabants had in them. I'm sure that they had to be like Yugoslavian knockoffs of Fiat's or something, probably, I would imagine. Javier, I've seen a lot of your boost videos and did an eBay GT45 and a six liter Silverado and it's a bit blast. It would be, that's a good little turbo and it, you, it definitely could make lots and lots of power on that six liter. Thinking about rebuilding my 2001 Jeep XJ four liter. What do I look for in cam for street off-road? So there's lots of um, cams out there for the Jeeps. I know that, that that's a fairly popular um, engine as far as like, aftermarket support. So there should be cams out there for it. In a four liter for a street motor, I would be looking at something like a 206, 212 kind of duration. Just buy a TA Performance Buick 3800 stroke or crate motor for 25,000. <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah, even Mustang 2s are, are pretty big money. You can't find a decent Mustang 2 for under five grand. I All of the Mustang stuff is really expensive. How about an LTD2? Yes. Have you seen much power out of a stock SRT4 neon motors? I haven't ever, I think I've, I've run one of those on the chassis dyno where we did a couple of things to it. We just did, you know, a bleed valve. We just raised the boost and stuff. And that's all that I've ever done. I've never run one on the engine dyno, but it is a four valve, four cylinder turbo motor. So it should be able to make pretty good power. The turbines were two strokes. Other than Brian Tooley, is there anyone else you've lined up would like to interview? Yeah, I have a whole list of people. We made a video experimenting with cam timing and where it becomes more or less efficient. I don't, I, what cam timing? Like advancing and retarding the cam? Because I've done some tests on advancing and retarding a cam. If you take a look at the video they have up on the LS9, I thought it was going to be a hero and advance the LS9 cam to get all of that wonderful low speed power that it's lacking in stock form, get all of that back. Um, but that didn't happen. <laughs> so sometimes it doesn't work. How big of a cam do you know that can fit before piston and valve clearance with trick flow 11 R heads? It depends on a lot of things. I don't know what short block you're talking about. Um, <laughs> You have to measure it. <laughs> you can't, I can't just tell you a number. A 93 SVT Cobra sold for a hundred grand at Meekum. Man. RX-8. I'm actually not a fan of the RX-8 body style. I saw one today. As a matter of fact, what, what got my attention is they had a, um, and it looks like they had just towed it because it still had the, um, the little tow dolly deal in front of it was an it, it was an 80 or an 81 um rx7 and so i thought oh that's cool and it was a little beat up so i'm sure that they got it because they're doing a project where but they also had an rx8 and i'm like you know what i know that that one's a lot more expensive but the rx7 i like the rx7 way better How many miles are on my fox you know i don't know not a lot i don't think it's been sitting for a long time The Futura Sports Coupe was a Fox chassis. So it was like a Granada. The thing that I don't like about the RX-8 is I don't like that it's a four-door. <laughs> I, 
the, the, it, the those kinds of cars needed to just be two two doors. Yeah, somebody did drive up the price of Fairmonts. <laughs> that, that's Matt. We can blame Matt for that. Oh, so Trevance had two stroke engines. Okay. I I know I really like the the third gen RX sevens. I like the way that those look. I like the twin turbo versions, and lo would love to have a stock one of those. But those are money too now. You guys are breathing pretty heavy. The trick flow top end stuff for the 302 works really well. I have a couple of videos up on where we did that, and that that definitely worked. Yeah, all the 90s stuff. The I'm sure that I haven't looked at them, but I'm sure that they would gotta gotta go along with that too. Are the 3000 GTVR4s um, and the Stealths? Obviously a you know, a Toyota Supra is ridiculous money. The Gen 2 RX-7 Turbo 2s, yeah, I think Rob just got one of those, right? What's the best cathedral aftermarket head? Take a look at the video I have up and pick whatever head you want. I tested a bunch of them. Will we ever see the twin turbo Big Bang Hemi test? I didn't run the Big Bang Hemi with twins. I ran it with a single. Seventies Comets and Mavericks. Tom, the guy that used to work at West Tech that did the Bonneville cars for me, um, he had a Comet and he he got his three hundred two. I think that that thing made over 500 horsepower. It was really good. Oh, 300 ZX twin turbos also, yeah. Actually, what I want is a 70, 71, 72. I kind of would, would even think about a 69 or 68 um, Chevelle. Who's that? They're in attack mode. Sixty-seven Chevelle drag car. I just want a street car. Sixty-seven with a four twenty-seven four speed. Nice. Would a bracket racing camshaft? I don't know what a bracket camshaft is. I have to look at the specs and see. Yeah, I just we just want a driver. I want something that Lisa and I can go out in, and that would be cool. But I'd like to do a big block. I sent off the pistons today, and to, this is a shout out to I think his name was Mike that I met over at UPS. I was shipping out some pistons down to uh, the guy that's putting together the 396, a 375 horse 396. I ordered new pistons for it and shipped them down to him. And while I was there, somebody in lines, uh, they, the people at UPS asked me what I was shipping. And I told them that they're pistons. And the guy looked over and said, hey, you're Richard Holdner. <laughs> and I said, yes. And so I talked to him and he's got, he's got a turbo LS, which is so it's a small world, kind of cool stuff. Chevelle, Chevette, those are those are exactly the same cars. A Chevette, though, with the with the V six in it would be kind of cool. I would imagine it's probably hard to find Chevettes too now. 
A 67 Skylark would be a great fit for the Buick 455. It would. I'm going to put the Buick 455 back together, do a few tests on it. I'm going to, I'm going to run it in stage one. I'm going to build a reproduction of the stage one motor because I want to see what it does. Um, and then I'm probably going to sell that motor to somebody that, that will put it in something. I should have. I learned to drive a stick in a 67 Camaro. Okay, two more minutes. A 455 with a 7875, that would be good, right? That's a thousand horsepower motor. The 706 and the 862 heads are the same in terms of performance and flow, but they're different castings that makes them different. Some people like the 862 head better because it's a different casting. And I'm told, I, I don't know for sure, but they said that it's less prone to cracking. <laughs> Who has the best last question? The seconds are ticking away. We only got 45 seconds left. Ooh, in a Spitfire. Actually, in a Spitfire, I would like to have a rotary in a Spitfire. But I do like those. I like those, but I like um, a rotary in a bug-eyed Sprite even more. 20 seconds. Ten, nine, everybody counted out just like it's like New Year's. <laughs> Thank you guys all for showing up. And I will, uh, I didn't finish the the header test, the inch and three quarter versus inch and seven eighths and all of the exhaust and all that stuff for the LS. So I should be able to put that up tomorrow. Hopefully we'll see all of that and you guys will get to see it tomorrow. And I will see all of you guys back on the live feed tomorrow. Thanks for showing up. See you on Sunday.